Hallelujah. God is good. Hallelujah. Give somebody a smile. You may be seated in the presence of the Most High God. Let's go very quickly to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 22 to 23. Keep playing your part after we read the scripture. Colossians chapter 3 uh, from 22. Read 22. 22 to 23. Colossians chapter 3 verse 22 to 23. Are we together? We are continuing in our series uh, which is the call of duty and the emphasis of this month is to help us to understand our responsibility to serve our community, to serve in the kingdom and to serve God ultimately. Every one of us is called to ministry. So I want you to look at your neighbor and tell them you are called to ministry. And you sound like you say it like you're recruiting them into the kingdom of God. Tell them you are called to ministry. Amen. And we want to break ministry down from the illusion that ministry is a microphone or ministry is for the select people that the heavens open up to and they hear a voice saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased in. Listen to him. But ministry is a calling uh, for every single one of us. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 says that God has given us the various ministries. Why? For the perfecting of the saints unto the work of ministry. So it is the saints that ought to carry out ministry. So every single one of us is called to a place where we ought to be ministers for God. In fact, I believe it's the book of Isaiah says you shall be known as the ministers of our Lord God. So each one of us is called to ministry. Now, I want to debunk ministry from uh, being something that is considered as, you know, for a select few, but it's actually God's design for every single one of you. Somebody say amen. Okay? So it's every single one of us that is called to serve. Now I want you to read this very quickly. Colossians chapter 3 verse 22 says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Not with eye service. Oh, I like this. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Okay? I don't know what version it is, but that's powerful. Okay? And it goes on to say, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Are we together? Let me read from the version that I have, which says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. This is the version, I think this is New Living Translation. It says, try to please them all the time, not just when they are, call, when they are watching you. Serve them sincerely because, you are reverent, because of your reverent fear of the Lord. So the underlying theme of this month is service. That each one of us, is called to serve okay serve God and serve God's people somebody say service so my teaching this evening um, in the next 24 minutes and or 23 minutes and 59 seconds is the will to serve I'm trying to let you guys go home early okay the will to serve service you can stop right there service is something that God has called each and every one of us to do, okay? Each one of us is called to serve in our respective areas of influence. Uh, wherever God places you, God has placed you there to be of service. And I know that when we become born again, our ideas of dominion are always rulership. And I agree with you, rulership is, is one of the things that God enthrones on us is through dominion. But the problem is this. We have a very worldly driven system or ideology with regards to dominion. When we think of dominion, we're constantly thinking of what others can do for us. Not realizing that where God placed you, God placed you in the same environment as he did to Adam and Eve. That they should have dominion and subdue. But watch this. The reason he gave them that authority is because he created them in the image and in the likeness of God. Right? And they had creative power and they governed the environment that they were in. 
So the idea of Adam's dominion was not just what people could do for him, but what he could do for his environment. Are we together? That's why we see the very first thing Adam does is he begins to work. He begins to serve on behalf of God. And whatever Adam called a thing, God said it was. Okay? So Adam was not just put in Eden so that everyone could just say, Mwemfumu. Okay? Because this is the thing that we have. We have this idea that, that dominion means that people should just come and say, How great you are. Dominion actually means that God has entrusted you with the ability to carry out his assignment wherever you are. That even though people may not think God is present, because you are present, is a, it is as good as God being present. Are we together? Because the earth is the Lord's, but he has given it to man. So the responsibility has been given to man. It means men must constantly look for ways to serve. Tell your neighbor, serve. Hey, look at them one more time and tell them, serve. So we are called to serve on behalf of God and serve the people around us. Are we together? Now, I want to touch a bit more on this idea because we know of an interesting story of the young uh, ruler, the rich young ruler. We know that story. Uh, the guy comes to the Lord and says, Lord, you know, I've kept all commandments. In other words, he says, I'm, I, I, I am holy, you know. I, I meet all the standards. And in fact, the way it describes him, it describes him as rich. And you know, when I read that scripture, it made me realize that this is what most of us think, that holiness is equated to wealth. That the holier you are, the wealthier you should be. Isn't that what we say to God sometimes? Lord, I, I serve you. Why am I struggling? <laughs> I serve you. Why am I suffering? So who should suffer? Because when you say that, it's almost as saying, no, that person qualifies for suffering, not me. Are we together? But I've come to realize that wherever God puts you there, he puts you there not just to amass things, but he puts you there to serve. If you can discover your reason for service, you discover your purpose for living. If you discover the way in which you can serve, you discover your purpose for living. So watch this. The rich young ruler says, I've kept all the commandments. Then Jesus says, okay, if you've kept all the commandments, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. See, Jesus was testing him on his ability to recognize that everything he had was for service, was for the kingdom. And the Bible clearly says that at that point, he was dejected. He was disgruntled, okay? Because many of us will miss the reason why we are alive. It's not to walk out with accolades, but it's to leave a legacy of service. You see, what, what people will remember you by is not what you acquired. What people will remember you by is not your level of income. It's your level of impact. You see, I've seen this. I read an interesting statistic today that Bill Gates has now given away close to $28 billion dollars for the work of philanthropy and for works all over the earth. Because he realizes that people will not remember him for computers. They'll remember him for how he used what he had for the benefit of other people. Somebody say serve. So wherever God has placed you, however God has designed you, he designed you to serve. Jesus shows the model for service because Jesus, who is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, shows that the world's system of service is that the king should be crowned. But Jesus showed that a king should die. Oh, can I preach that one again? How would our countries be if we had kings that were ready to die for the benefit of their people? How would our businesses be if we had owners 
who were ready to die. You see, the world aims to be served, but we desire to serve. The world aims to be served, but we desire to serve. I think I've told you guys about the time I was in high school. So I was in high school. My high school was real. We beat. We used to beat. Not nicely beat. We beat. Okay? In fact, of the six years, for four years, I would shower cold. For four years. Okay? So you, you'd alternate. For two years, you shower cold. Then the third year, you get to shower hot. Showering hot was a privilege. It, walking on the grass was a privilege. Okay? Drinking juice was a privilege. In fact, for the first two years, you were not allowed to walk anywhere outside of your hostel. Anywhere outside of your hostel, you had to run. Such that the first time my mother came to visit me, she, was, she broke down in tears, saying, my child, what have I done? My young brother secretly confessed that when they left me at this school with these mammoth guys, he turned to my father and mother and said, how can you do this to my brother? You've left him with these guys. So I endured four to five years of hardship, and I was waiting for the sixth year. Because in the sixth year, I got to be the boss. <laughs> ah. And in the sixth year, those poor children who came in their first year would pay for all the sins. All the sins. I was a nice guy. I still beat. I want to apologize to all the children that I beat. <laughs> And you see this, this is what has affected our psychology, okay? And, and, and it was a bit difficult when I came to the kingdom to say, but Jesus, you waited 30 years, three years of service to die? What kind of kingship is that? That doesn't make sense. But you see, that's what our God desires of us. To be willing to die in places that don't even make sense. Because that is service. It's amazing that Jesus' selfless act of service is what made him renowned throughout the world. Service will never keep you hidden. When you are a true, selfless servant of God, you cannot be hidden. I can prove it. So, so was looking after his father's donkeys. Lost them. Even said, ah, let's bounce. So who cares? Donkeys, father will come looking for me. I am worth more. Did you hear? So even says, my father will worry about us. Not the donkeys. Okay? Are we clear? So his mind was more on his father worrying about him than the donkeys, right? And he became king. But we all know what kind of a king Saul became. Because when Saul became king, he became a self-centered king. You see that? So the attitude so hard at the lower level was eventually amplified when he became king. Such that when Samuel delayed to sacrifice, he said, hey, let me carry out this sacrifice. After all, Samuel is delaying and embarrassing me. Samuel asked him, how could you do such a thing? He says, you took too long. People were going. I was going to be embarrassed. But watch David. David had gone through two trials. <laughs> two trials. Fought a bear and fought a lion. Unseen. Listen to me. If I fought a donkey, you would know. Me, donkey. Just a donkey. I'll say there was a demon-possessed donkey from the east. But when it spoke, it spoke Nigerian. 
But nobody knew of David's trials until he voiced them. Because that was the true heart of a servant. And eventually, he was the king that was after God's own heart. Because he was a heart, or he was, serv- he was a servant at a heart. Such that when he could shepherd sheep, he would still have the same attitude with the children of Israel. Beloved, I need you to learn one thing. You need to have a servant heart. You've got to have a servant heart. When a servant is, is positioned by God, it's a matter of time before they are lifted by the same God. Because if you humble yourself before God, he will in due season lift you up. In your place of work, are you a servant? In family, are we servants? Are we servants? You see, we need to deal with the issue of servanthood. Because if we don't, we'll have the wrong kind of leaders. There was a minister in a foreign land that said this. He said... (laughs) He said, when you tie a goat to the pole, when he was referring to civil servants, it's okay for the goat to eat the grass around the pole. Meaning, if you are in a ministry, go ahead and eat in that ministry. Now, some of you are like, oh my God. What a hopeless guy. But let's look at where you work. Are we together? So let's not be too quick to judge civil servants. Because we're always quick to say, "Ah, civil servants, no, the government. Government are not aliens. They are from your country. So they are a representation of you. So if you want to change government, change the people. And until servanthood becomes a way of life for us, we we'll constantly have people who will go in there to get what they want. That's why even in ministry, people start ministries not because of Jesus. Okay. And if you think it's new, check your Bible. The Bible says, Paul said, some preach Christ for gain. But nonetheless, we glorify or we celebrate. We honor God as long as Christ is preached. It's not new. But when we bring it back even into the church, we've got to look at it and say, are we being raised as servants for the kingdom? Look at your neighbor and tell them, serve. The world aims to be served, but our attitude, or we should, we should serve not to be served. It's amazing that, as I try to bring this quickly, that the Apostle Paul speaks to the children of Israel or speaks to the, the church uh, at, at the Colossian, in the book of Colossians. He says, um, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Please realize that Paul is not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to believers. And this constantly perplexed me because I looked at this and said, I don't think this is the word the slaves wanted to hear. The slaves wanted to hear in three days, the Lord shall send a mighty wind. Remember, this is Paul the apostle who had been locked up and saw God release him from the prisons. But this is also the Paul the apostle who wrote in the book of Philippians, rejoice in the Lord. Always. And again, I say rejoiced while still in jail. Because he shows something here. That our circumstances should never determine our attitude. A true servant does not wait for the environment to serve. They serve in the environment they are in. A true servant does not wait for the, for the things to change so that they can do something. They begin to do something exactly where they are. 
It's amazing that Joseph, no matter the trouble he got into, always found a position of responsibility. He comes as a slave. And I believe it's because Joseph had such a helpful attitude that he would say, ah, Vapoti, Potiphar. That was Potiphar's. Vapio. Why don't we try this? I see that you are, you know, planting your maize in this way. But why don't you try doing something like this? And I believe that because of the suggestions, this is my sanctified imagination, that Joseph gave. Potiphar was saying, ah, no, this guy. You know what? He's powerful. Let me put him as a boss. And even when Joseph was accused and thrown in another jail cell, he still somehow found his way into leadership. Because servanthood is an attitude. It is an identity irrespective of where you are. So so Paul says to them, Don't just serve them when they are looking at you. Because many of us, we're good good at that. Look, I'm good at that. You know what I mean? Give the boss exactly what they want. And when they're not looking, ah, get out. But Paul says that's not the way of Christ. He says don't just serve when they're looking. How many of us work in environments where we say, is this your father's company? Do you see my surname on the billboard? It will never be there if you keep saying that. Because our circumstances do not determine our attitude. Your attitude is who you are in spite of your circumstances. You cannot be emotional in service. (laughs) <laughs> that's why some all of you so, 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 so let me bring it down to your level where you are working you are offering a service and that service specifies your time your hours irrespective of your mood whether you feel like it whether you don't feel like it and Paul says obey almost showing that service is an act of obedience It's not an act of maybe I feel like it, maybe I don't. Because we wait for things to line up in our favor, you know, to pursue service. That's not the way it works. Because our circumstances don't determine our attitude. A child of God must have the will to serve. As a child of God, wherever you are, you've got to have the will to serve. You've got to be able to volunteer yourself and find opportunities. You've got to be able to stand up and say, maybe let's try it this way. Maybe let's do this. What I've found in pastoral, my pastoral career or time in church is that people are so good at giving ideas. Okay? But I have this blessed gift in me. And when someone brings an idea, I say, that's great. You do it. And the minute you say that, no, me, no, no. Because many of us love God. We love God. It's not that we don't love God, but we have not quite have, or we don't quite have the will to serve, the desire to serve. Okay? We must have the will. Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. That means that God's will becomes your will. And if God's will becomes your will, It means that a child of God must have the will to serve. Because Jesus said, for this very purpose, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. You must have the will to serve. That if I'm in this university, this university will not know me as a a rascal, okay? They will remember me. As somebody who influenced and impacted this university. If I work for an institution, they will remember me for the good that I did. If you are in a family, they will remember you for what you did for them. Not just what they did for you. So God watches us on how we serve our earthly masters. This scripture is very, very strong. 
God watches our attitude on how we serve our earthly masters. It, it, it begins to show me one thing, that justice is the Lord's, okay? That let God deal with your master, but the way you deal with your master is by serving him wholeheartedly. God can never leave his people in bondage. Watch this. God says to, to Moses, go and tell uh, uh, Pharaoh, let my people go. Do you know that the whole time they were still working? He didn't tell them, go on strike. This is God now. This is God, right? This is God, right? Why did God have to negotiate with Pharaoh? God could have just said, poof, you have moved from Egypt to Canaan land. Is it not Stephen who teleported? So why couldn't God teleport the whole nation? He could. But he wanted to show you this. That service to the world is compulsory wherever you are. Oh yes. He could have removed the whole nation. And everyone would have said, Ha, ah, lesa, wamaka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three million people disappeared and reappeared. Jehovah, you are the most Now, beloved, could that not be why God has not moved you so quickly from that problem that you're going through? Because our prayer is always, Lord, remove me, cancel this, get me out, lift me tomorrow. And God is saying, change, have a right attitude, develop the right character, and I will come on your behalf. It's amazing that even though they were in captivity, God never stopped them from working. Because God measures our service to our earthly masters as responsibility. Because if you cannot serve the master whom you see, how can you serve the master whom you can't see? Uh-uh. And it showed because no, no sooner had the children of Israel left Egypt that they started saying, ah, we miss watermelon. 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 Because it's possible to be obedient but not be a servant. Some of us, the only reason we do certain things right now is because somebody has authority over you. Let me, let me take it a bit further. Let, let's go to relationships. Can I go into relationships? Can I go deeper? Can I go deeper? How many of us would love one partner if God said it was okay to love more than one? Oh! Some of you are like, no, look, after all, you are unable to reach that cabinet, so I need the other person to reach We need two so that we, we balance things out. Watch this. Because it's possible to be, ob to be obedient because of rules. Not because you truly desire or agree. But God wants us to have a heart of servanthood irrespective of who our master is. Because servants... Is who we are called to be at all times. Stop praying for your boss to die. He will live. Live longer. Long. In fact, the more the children of Israel cried, the harder Potiphar became. He will live. Can you serve somebody who doesn't like you? Can you be like a, a David who saw has just thrown a spear at you and you still refuse to kill him? Someone threw a spear at me. Huh, my guy. 
my prayer points will change for you. Father, bombard them. Dislocate them. Strangulate them. But watch this. David refused to sin to kill his master because he would be sinning against God. We must become servants. Stand to your feet. Let me leave you with this. This last quote, I want you to hear me. Service is not just about doing what you love. Because the world system will tell you, do what you love. Do. Follow your passion. Follow your heart. You know what I mean? Great people never just followed their heart. They literally found their places, themselves in places where their heart compelled them to do something about something. Mother Teresa did not go to India and say, I'm looking for poor people. She, she didn't, she didn't. She went there, she saw something. And her heart was compelled to do something. Don't just do what you love as a servant, but love what you do. Our hearts need to move from just doing what we love. Because when we just do what we love, we're not servants. When we do what we love, it means that whatever falls outside of our unique skill set or our unique ability, we'll immediately refrain from. We'll say things like, that's not my ability. That's not my character. That's not my type. That's not my way. But God is looking for people who are going to say, whatever it is that you want me to do, Lord, I will do it. If it means cleaning the toilets, I will do it. If it means sweeping the floor, I will do it. You've got to learn to humble yourselves, beloved. Before Ruth found Boaz, her career aspirations were not in the field. Her career aspirations were not looking for harvest opportunities. Her career aspirations were not trying to find her way to the feet of a man. Her career aspirations were for bigger and greater things. But there came a point where she could not do what she loved. But she said, I will love whatever I do. If it means I'm going to glean in the harvest, I will be the best at it if it means that whatever position I'm in I will be the best at it I will do my best I will constantly not complain I will constantly look to do and give the very best of what's in me and it was that heart and that attitude that made Boaz say who does that young woman belong to because the heart of a servant can never be ignored when people don't just do what they love. Listen to me. If you are just saying, I need to follow my passion. I agree. Follow your passion. I agree. I agree. I agree with you. But you will never do what you love until you begin to love whatever you do. Love what you do. And then you will do what you love. That's the key. To love what you do, then you do what you love. Because until you can learn to love what you do, God will never entrust us with what we love. Today my prayer for you is wherever you are, may God give you a heart of a servant. May God give you a heart of a servant. Now, when they talk ill of your boss, don't participate in it. Because you're just crippling your own progression. David ministers to me because in the whole time that Saul is persecuting him, he never slanders Saul. Because if it was us today, we say, Nindo shium, guys. So, Nindo shi. You would even start talking about his relatives. But David never talks about his master. In fact, 
Oh man, even when Saul is dead, David wept. Wept. May God give us the right heart. Right heart. The right heart. May we leave behind a legacy of service. That the day you enter that institution, people will remember you. The day you enter the city of Ndola, it remembered you. And the day you leave this earth, may your service speak for you like it did for Tabitha. That even when she was dead, the people gathered around and said, no, 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 no. Her service was so great, she cannot die at this point. Father, we just want to thank you. We want to glorify you. Give us a heart of service. Give us a heart of service. That our hearts will be given unto you as we serve others. As we serve in our places of influence, impact, in our places of calling. That at the end, you will receive all the glory. Take the glory from our lives. May our work ethic become ministry unto the world. May the standard and the quality of the services rendered by your people become a testimony of how great you are. May people see a difference in your children by their integrity, by their efficacy, by their standards and by their excellence, God, begin to separate them. I release a spirit of excellence like that on Caleb. An excellent spirit like that of Daniel that will separate your people for greater, for higher, for stronger places of calling and influence. We glorify and we honor you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We have prayed. And everyone in this house said a believing amen. Come on, somebody celebrate the Lord. Say amen.